Okay. We're here to welcome Professor Stephen Patel, who's delivering a faculty seminar for us today. Uh, Stephen's uh, about to become full professor at the University of Western Ontario, but a, a loyal uh, alumnus of Dalhousie Law School, as it then was. And uh, take it away, Stephen. Do you want to trade seats now? So no, you this, can this is okay. I, I think as long as we're, we're good and set up, as right. far as the recording goes. Uh, Brent, thanks very much. Uh, Richard, thank you very much for hosting and for organizing. I, I know time is difficult, and I want to thank everybody for attending because uh, it's a tough time of, of the week and of the day, so I'm certainly grateful for the opportunity to uh, have an audience uh, to talk about this issue. Uh, I want to thank, uh, especially given that we're recording for posterity, I want to thank obviously my, my co-author, uh, Jordan McKee, who is uh, a second-year student at Western University at the moment, so this was a project that he worked with me on in his summer after uh, first year, and I think he did he did some very good work uh, for somebody at that stage of their legal education. Uh, and I want to thank the law firm of Goodman's LLP, which sponsors the Goodman's uh, Faculty Fellowship in Legal Ethics and Professionalism at Western University, and has allowed uh, my my colleague and, and co-holder of the fellowship, Randall Graham, and I. Uh, the opportunity to do some interesting things in the legal ethics area that, but for the funding that we receive, um, might not otherwise have been possible. So I'm quite grateful for, for that. I understand uh, from Richard that, that the audience has, or at least has had available, uh, an earlier version of, the, of this paper. Uh, this paper sort of been a work in progress, and I, I looked at it and, and got it to a particular point last fall, and over the course of the last week or so in preparing for this particular discussion, uh, it's evolved, I think, in some ways s significantly. Uh, so I, I'm warning you now in advance that those of you that might uh, ask questions about specific things that the paper you have in front of you says, my answer may well be, it doesn't say that anymore. Uh, that's now gone, and it says something different. So that may be my strategic out, although the theme of the paper and, and the ground that the paper covers certainly hasn't changed. But the, the way some of the arguments are put, I think, has been made a bit more focused and, and a bit uh, clearer. So uh, the, the topic, uh, which I will introduce just by way of setting out a, a sort of a standard fact to get out in front or lay some groundwork for an area that I think will become uh, a more involved area over time. And I suppose the third reason I think the paper is of value is, uh, in a sense, uh, it's applying a number of Canadian uh, ethical principles from some of the key leading cases and from some of the uh, rules that we have to a particular situation as a kind of a case study. And even if the case study may not be all that commonly arising out there in, in practice, uh, we can still learn a number of things about the rules themselves from seeing how they apply to this particular case study. So the, the scenario that the paper talks about is, is this. Uh, we have a client who hires a law firm, and we're going to talk mainly about major, large law firms, hundreds of lawyers at a law firm, typically. Client hires a law firm, there's a partner on the file who's primarily handling the file, there may be other lawyers in the firm who are working on the, the client's matter, uh, and something happens that, that leads the partner to think uh, we may have uh, violated some ethical obligation here in handling the client's matter, or we may have committed malpractice, we may have actually done something wrong as lawyers in handling this, this file for the client. So the partner uh, goes down the hall to another lawyer in the firm and says, look, here's the problem, here's what's happened, uh, you're an experienced person, you know a lot about malpractice and legal ethics and that sort of thing, what should we do uh, in order to minimize or reduce our exposure and protect ourselves as a firm and you know, how do we make this problem go away and maybe uh, be you know, able to satisfy our concerns and the client's potential concerns and keep this thing moving um, forward. And so there's, there's a communication there, there's a discussion there, there's correspondence perhaps back and forth between the partner and that other lawyer within the firm, something gets written, documented, what have you. Uh, partner makes a decision and partner, uh, based on that, carries on with acting on the client's matter. And even that could take a number of forms. That, that could take a number of forms in terms of the lawyer just saying to the client, oh, by the way, I looked into this and we're, we're good to go. It's not a problem. I've satisfied ourselves that there's no, no difficulties here. So it's not something you'd even thought of, client, but I'm, I thought about it and I, we're fine and away we go. Uh, at a much more dramatic end of the scale, it could be actually having to tell the client, 
Uh, we think we may well have screwed up here. We think there may be a problem involving our malpractice. Uh, and we're now getting into much more difficult conversations with you, client, about you potentially having to go refer, find new counsel, uh, and potentially have to think about having a claim against us as a firm based on our, our malpractice. So, so there's a wide spectrum of kind of what could happen uh, when the partner lawyer goes back and talks to the client after this, this circumstance. Uh, what the firm is likely to want to happen, though, is somehow that the matter continues on, that the firm continues acting for the client. They've sort of smoothed over whatever the problem was and that they carry on. So let, let's say in one of those lesser cases where the firm hasn't sort of directly come out and told the client, this has got to come to an end, you're going to have to go out and get new counsel, um, the client starts being concerned. The client says, ooh, I, I hadn't thought of that. Are you sure we're okay? And, and could you fill me in more on why we're okay? And, and in fact, could I see what this other lawyer told you or wrote down for you as to why it is you now think you're okay? Um, or the client might say, oh, I'm pretty sure we're not okay. This sounds horrible. And the client decides to pull the plug and go retain new counsel and sue the former lawyers for, for malpractice. And in any number of those situations, the issue then that, that I'm focusing on is what happens if the client says, I want to see the communication between you, partner, and the lawyer you went to talk to within the firm about this issue. I want disclosure of that. I want you to give me a copy of that communication passing between you within the firm. And at one level, we might think that should just be a no-brainer. I'm the client. I hired this law firm. That means I hired all the lawyers at this law firm to work for me. There can't possibly be anything passing between those lawyers in the firm about my case that they can keep from me. I'm the client. They owe me a fiduciary duty. They owe me a duty of candor. They, they got to release whatever they've got that relates to my, my matter. And what the paper does is it, 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 it suggests, and maybe we could think about that differently, that there might be a different answer to that question, that it might actually be possible, and th that's what the paper wants to explore, that the firm could claim privilege, that the firm could actually claim a solicitor-client privilege for the communication passing between what we're called the ethics council within the firm and the partner who went to get the advice from the ethics council, and that the firm could set that privilege up as against its client and say, you don't get to see what we were told because that was legal advice provided to us and so it's privileged, and you don't get to see it. You don't get to see it by requesting it, and you don't get to see it through a discovery process if you're suing us for malpractice. And so what, what the paper focuses on is, is could that work? I mean, could, could such a claim for privilege be entertained? Would it be successful? Uh, and if conceptually it could work, what are the circumstances in which we think it, it viably could work or should work? In other words, what preconditions might... What, 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 what might we need to add to that fact situation that I've set out before we would think that privilege could attach to that communication? Um, so the, the paper then divides into, after setting that up, the paper divides into, into two parts. Uh, and the first is to look at the American experience on, on this issue. Because I didn't just wake up one day and think, hey, what a neat idea. Uh, I became aware that this is an issue in the United States, that there are cases on this issue and that there is some jurisprudence on this issue and some writing on this issue, commentary on the issue. Uh, and so I wanted to explore what the American experience is on this question, and I wanted to see how could that potentially translate over into the Canadian context. Uh, and so the first part of the paper deals with the American experience, and it's much longer than I would like it to be for an article that's primarily aimed at mapping the issue for a Canadian landscape. And, but the reason it's long, longer than I would sort of like it to be is because there isn't a useful summary of the analysis of the American law out there in the American literature, and uh, the law in the U.S. is in flux. So over literally the last two years, there have been some fairly significant developments in the U.S. case law on the issue that haven't translated into uh, an easy reference point that I could just take on board as a starting point for the U.S. law uh, and, and, and go from there. So I needed in the paper to map out the position in the United States before then seeing where that would take us in, in Canada. Uh, so, I'll, so that's the way I'll divide up the remainder of the time that I have, is to say a little bit about the American context and then to look at more at, perhaps at the Canadian context. So in the US, um, the, the short answer is yes, there is such privilege. You can claim privilege on communications between a lawyer and a firm and their ethics counsel. Uh, the reason that that then gets very problematic is because, and, and they got to that position, not perhaps surprisingly, by analogy with in-house counsel in, at a corporation, right? So in other words, if a, corp, if a 
any other large entity, like an accountant firm or a bank, uh, is allowed to have in-house counsel, why shouldn't law firms be able to have in-house counsel? And if privilege attaches to communications with in-house counsel generally, why shouldn't privilege attach to in-house counsel or happen to be in-house within a law firm? So the Americans said that. That should be fine. There's no real conceptual problem there. But the problem is, literally almost in the same breath as saying that, the American jurisprudence said, but the privilege will always be defeated if in-house counsel is in a conflict of interest vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the sort of the client, the original client, and the firm. And that, I guess that sounds, we might pull back for a second and say, well, why should a conflict of interest defeat the operation of a privilege? But it, maybe even setting that to one side, I, we can certainly see that we would be concerned if there was a true conflict of interest between the in-house counsel and the uh, original client and, and the firm, and that that might well cause us pause to, as to, to allowing a privilege to operate with regards to these communications. But the problem is the American jurisprudence uh, then said, well, if the client, the original client, is a current client, uh, the, part, the original partner has an obvious conflict of interest because they know about the clients, the need to put the client's interest first and all the rest of it, but they also now are on notice that the firm may have a separate and divergent concern from the client's concern, being sued for malpractice, having done something wrong ethically. Oh, and by the way, says the American law, um, that conflict is automatically imputed to every other lawyer in the firm, including in-house ethics counsel. So going down the hall to the Ethics Council doesn't solve the problem. That's no different than you just asking yourself in your office uh, how to handle this uh, dimension. So the American law says, yeah, the privilege exists, but in, paradoxically, the, the case where you would most need it to operate, which is while the client is still your client, you're in a conflict of interest that you can't get out of, and therefore that defeats the privilege. And that's to be distinguished from the situation where somehow if you fire the client or the client bails on your firm, and then you go to your in-house counsel and start preparing a defense, for example. That's privilege. No, no, no problem, again, in the American law that that's privilege, because they're not your client anymore, so you don't have a conflict of interest there. Uh, OK, but that's not controversial, and that shouldn't trouble us, right? The difficulty is law firms are likely going to need to get legal advice before their client has bailed on them, either because they might need to tell them they need to bail on them, or they might want to try to salvage the situation, um, but I will take questions as we go. I should have said that earlier, Steve. Yeah, um, I guess I'm having difficulty with a, a slightly earlier step. I don't see why the conflict of interest defeats the privilege. I mean, I can see why the conflict of interest makes you think the advice is no good or right. stuff like yep. that, but yep. I don't see what that's got to do with a privilege. No, and I, I, think, that's a, I think that's a fair question, um, and, and I, I, I have to admit, I want to think about that a little bit more as well. The cases take it as a given that that, in other words, that's the way they set it up. They, they say, we accept that this privilege operates, but uh, if the, they, they, they say the law firm is in a, oh, is a fiduciary relationship to its clients, and if there is any, conf any conflict of interest in that relationship, the privilege is, as the courts say, defeated. The, the privilege just doesn't, you, you cannot set up that privilege as against the beneficiary under this fiduciary relationship, would be maybe another way that they, they put it. You, you, you have to disclose to the beneficiary under your fiduciary relationship. I, I, I agree with, I'm, I'm not 100% sure why that must be the case. I, yeah. You could, I mean, be, in, you could be in breach of your fiduciary obligations, but still somehow be allowed to rely on a privilege. But that's the way the American courts set the jurisprudence in motion. They, they say, on the one hand, we, we, we grant that the firms can have this privilege, but they can't somehow maintain it if they're in a conflict of interest position. It just seemed, it just, they take it that it would be wrong to allow the lawyer who owes these fiduciary obligations to rely on solicitor client privilege to the, be, to the detriment of the beneficiary in a situation of conflict. It's not like they analyze it as joint privilege or anything nope, like that. No, nope, not at all. That okay. They just say, they, and, and bizarrely, and the paper talks about this, the, the leading cases call this the fiduciary exception yeah. to solicitor-client privilege, which is strange because if the relationship is a fiduciary one, any exception could be characterized as a fiduciary exception because it's a fiduciary relationship. And what the paper says is it's not, it's not really right to call it a fiduciary exception. It's an exception founded on this conflict of interest. Right but there. you had an outside lawyer to... That's right. You can, You'd be fine. Yeah. 
Yep. And, 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 in part, and again, that's, why, that's in part what dry, yeah. that's clearly what's driving the courts to say, well, of course the privilege must exist for in-house mm -hmm. ethics counsel, because why should it conceptually make any difference if I, instead of going down the hallway to my own internal ethics counsel, I pick up the phone and I actually retain outside counsel? No question that would be privileged. Now, there's no conflicting interest there, because my, the guy I've hired outside is in no way obliged to my original client. So you don't have the conflict of interest problem. The conflict of interest problem arises because you're using somebody who's internal to the firm and because the American cases are very aggressive in imputing the conflict from the original partner to the in-house ethics counsel. So there is a difference between the in-house person and the external one. Yep. At least factually, it seems to me, right? Because I think it's going to be very ambiguous when you walk down the hall, whether you're walking down the hall to say, in contemplation of litigation, yes, yes. I want your advice, yes. or whether you're just saying, what yes. do you think I ought to do here? I want to bounce some ideas off you because yeah, you're yeah. my partner. No, and that's totally right. And the, the, we, we will come to talk about that. That's like a kind of different issue, which is the sort of agency versus principal issue. In other words, did you retain your internal person yeah. as I mean, principal, I meaning I want you to advise the firm, but, yeah. versus did you retain this person as a flow through? You're just acting as agent for your for the actual client. And there will be lots of circumstances. There's no question about that. I mean, if I'm doing a transaction and I need some tax advice and I walk down the hall and I ask a tax partner, hey, how do we handle this? And the tax partner says, this is how we handle it. No, wait, that's privilege. That's not advising the firm. That's advising on behalf of the client, right? That's because the, the uh, client is the ultimate client there in that, in that circumstance. So yeah, one of the issues we're going to face is how, do we dis how could we meaningfully distinguish those two sorts of advice? I think you can. But we're certainly going to have to talk about that, right? How could we meaningfully distinguish those circumstances? Uh, so, the, so the American so law. Remember to so, self fit in me this picture. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just work, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't. I can't see how that could attract privilege, right? Because you, what you don't have is a communication between a lawyer and a client, right? You, you, you can't be your own lawyer and client at the same time, right? Then we get into the fool for a client part, but that's a, perhaps a separate aspect of that. So, so the American law uh, recognizes a privilege, but then kind of ruins it right when it would be perhaps most important to, to have it. Now, this is all, some of these questions are, are great because they also they remind me to refer back to part of the earlier part of the paper. There's an earlier chunk of the paper that actually walks through the rationale and benefits of in-house ethics counsel. And the Americans are clearly all over that, right? The ABA actually says firms should have internal go-to ethics counsel. They want that to be the operating practice for American firms. And uh, insurers, right, people who are writing, you know, the policies for law firms, uh, you, your premiums are in part dependent on whether you have in-house ethics counsel or not because the insurance companies think, based on the statistical evidence and the information that they have, that they're a better risk if they actually have somebody in-house who is handling ethics issues on behalf of the, of the firm. So there's a lot out there in the American context that wants this to operate. And in a sense, then we run into this problem where you kind of can't have it both ways. If you want to do it this way, as opposed to making you always have to go out and hire external counsel, we've got to, we've surely got to provide you with the concomitant benefits that you would get of doing it this way, right? We, we can't sort of be trying to encourage you on the one hand to use an internal ethics counsel, but take away one of the core hallmarks of that, which would be a, a solicitor client privilege that you would get in respect to those communications that you would went if you, that you would get if you went outside. Um, so the American jurisprudence more recently has been struggling with these uh, concepts, and we've had now a few cases that have come along and and I think changed the the landscape. Although I mean, they're, they're quite recent. I mean, I watched the video argument of uh, one of the most recent ones, which is a case out of the Georgia uh, Court of Appeals. Uh, from 2012, and then just earlier this year, it was argued in the Georgia Supreme Court. So depending on what the Georgia Supreme Court does to the lower intermediate appellate court's decision, the law is very much in flux on this. Uh, but what the American courts, is they've, they've said, they've done a few things. And, and this is also relevant to some broader themes in US uh, ethics law, which, as, as some of you will know, uh, has started to become less quick to just have these automatic imputations of, of conflict. But the, the, the ABA has been under significant pressure and that a number of state bars have been moving much faster than the ABA in saying these automatic imputations of conflicts across large firms doesn't make the sense that conceptually uh, maybe just we think should be happening on an automatic 
basis. And so what the courts have been doing is that the, sort of the jurisprudence has been moving in two directions. One is to say we should be willing to look at this on a case-by-case -case basis rather than just automatically assume these conflicts are being imputed across to ethics counsel. And that sets up some interesting ideas because what the, what the cases and what the literature then gets into is, well, okay, how would, how would you, this kind of back to Steve's question, how would you, what would you do on a case-by-case -case basis to kind of stop an imputation um, that, that, for example, that the ethics counsel is in exactly the same position as the partner who's actually acting on the file? Uh, and they talk about some things that are actually kind of familiar to us in a Canadian landscape. They talk about things like screening. Right? They, they talk about things like ethical and information screening. So for example, if you had an ethics counsel who was a designated ethics counsel, they were not somebody you would go to just to get some advice about an aspect of the transaction or, or what have you. You would only be going to them because you needed advice qua firm rather than for the client. Uh, and so, that, so there's a number of layers you can build into that. Perhaps that person would not carry on any independent practice. They would not actually have any clients. They wouldn't handle client files. Their only client would be the firm. Uh, they would be screened on an information basis. From, so they wouldn't be coming into contact generally with uh, information about what was going on across the firm on various matters. And at cocktail parties, lawyers would know this, and they wouldn't say to their in-house ethic, hey, by the way, and sort of just transfer information across. There'd be this system of screening whereby you keep this person somewhat segregated. Uh, the other form of screening that gets talked about is a financial screening, right? Because one of the things we haven't sort of talked about is, well, isn't the in-house ethics council going to have a financial, in like, so let's say this client generates thousands of hours of billable revenue a year for the firm. That puts the person in a conflict of interest in terms of whether, you know, do we say, oh, we've got to dump this client or, you know, we've got to send them elsewhere. You know, oh, I don't want to do that. If my, if my bonus as ethics counsel hinges on those hours being generated, then I have a financial conflict of interest problem. So again, you can, you can if you choose to, uh, arguably set up screening for that sort of thing. So you can say ethics counsel will be paid differently than other partners within the firm. They may be paid on a flat, pre-agreed amount. They're not going to share in um, bonuses that might come off of particular transactions. They're not going to have a cut of a draw based on you know, aggregate hours billed out to clients and, and so forth. So once you move beyond automatic imputation and automatically saying every lawyer in the firm has the same conflict as the original partner, and you instead are willing to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, you at least conceptually can say, we could create a case within our firm where our ethics counsel really was operating almost like they were an external counsel, but they just happened to be located within our, within our particular firm. And the other thing that cases do, there's a recent um, uh, fiduciary, and this is in a trust context, it's not in a law firm context, but there's a recent uh, 2011 US Supreme Court decision on sort of fiduciary and trust laws um, about the extent to which fiduciaries can obtain their own legal advice, right? Legal advice for them as fiduciary that doesn't somehow automatically flow through and have to be disclosed down to the beneficiary. And that case was one of the sort of first in, in this area to sort of cut through the chaff and kind of Steve's point again to say, we have to ask that question. Were they being retained as counsel for the firm, or the, that is the, the fiduciary in that particular case, or were they just as an agent for the ultimate beneficiary? And, and that needs to be the focal question. And again, that question can only be answered on a case-by-case -case basis. You, ha you have to sort of look at the circumstances of each retention and say, well, were you doing that um, as agent or as principal? And that's, the, that's kind of where the American story ends. It, it's in flux, but it's developing. And the way I sign off on it is to say, I think the US law is going to say, there are two key hallmarks for this privilege, which the, the cases say exists, that the two hallmarks for this privilege being working, that is not being defeated, would be that your in-house ethics counsel isn't in a conflict of interest in this narrower sense. That is, we're not going to just automatically impute it, right? But if we do a more focused analysis and they're not in a conflict of interest, information, finance, that kind of stuff, and they've been retained uh, by the firm as principal. If they meet those two criteria, the privilege should survive. The privilege should work and not be defeated. Right? But if they've been retained, in fact, as a flow through for the client, or they are in an actual conflict of interest, the privilege will fail, subject to this point of the interrelation between those two aspects.
So then I said, OK, well, that's, that's the American law. Well, how does that translate into the Canadian context? Is the, if, we, if we take what we now know about Canadian ethics law, does the analysis look the same? Is it, is it different? Uh, and in some ways, it's, it's similar. And in some ways, it's quite different. So two, the two points of similarity would be uh, conflict of interest based on confidential information, so the Martin and Gray problem. So the paper walks through Martin and Gray and says, well, no, if we were going to impute this information across everybody in the firm, we'd have a problem because the ethics council would know everything the partner knows. But we've already solved that problem under Canadian ethics law. Martin and Gray allows us to set up these ethical screens. It allows us to hive off a particular lawyer within a firm in the context of lawyers migrating between firms. Why couldn't we do the same sort of thing for ethics council exactly as I discussed earlier? So, so we could manage the, the conflict of information based on confidential information. Um, we could manage that through screening. And we could do the same sorts of things I talked about earlier with regards to pay in a Canadian context to manage conflict potentially based on self-interest or financial interest. And the agency uh, argument works pretty much the same way in the Canadian context. We do have some good Canadian cases about uh, the ability of fiduciaries to obtain counsel for themselves that they don't have to pass through, down, and reveal to their, the beneficiary under the fiduciary relationship. The sticking point, and, and the part that I've had the most trouble with, and again, I, I say trouble with, maybe this isn't the greatest hallmark of legal scholarship, but I, I kind of would like, for the benefit, for the reasons that I, that I outline in the paper of why ethics counsel seems to me to be a good thing, I kind of want this to work in Canada, right? So I'm not being very empirical about that. I'm, I'm not sort of just sitting in judgment and saying, oh, no, interesting idea, but won't work in Canada. I'd like to explore the case by which it could work in Canada, because I think it would be beneficial for Canadian, for big Canadian law firms to have ethics counsel. Because as, as some of us know, they are starting to do this. Right? Big firms like McCarthy's and Blake's and Tories do have people that they are designated as their ethics counsel to fill exactly this sort of role. And that's something I think is going to increase across Canadian law firms. But again, the utility of that is going to be somewhat defeated if we can't, among other things, sort the privilege issues out. Well, what's the sticking point? Well, the sticking point is this Neil duty of loyalty problem. Because, and that gets the paper into some sort of dangerous waters about the Federation's view versus the CBA's view on the duty of loyalty and that conflict of interest, although even, on, even both of those are potentially problematic. So here's the problem. If the bright line rule in Neil says that a law firm cannot act both for and against a current client, then that just might be the end of it right there because the law firm is clearly still acting for the client during that period of time, but the lawyer, the in-house ethics counsel at the firm is clearly acting for the, client, for the firm, against the client, right? at least in adverse interest to the client. So on a very literal formulation of Neil, we look like, not because of money or confidential information, but just this idea of loyalty, we just look like we might not be able to make this work. And even on the CBA's conception, which would require a significant risk of impairment in the representation, well, I, I think you can make, I think the client would certainly make the argument that now having my lawyer also acting for itself against me runs the risk of significantly impairing the quality of its representation of me. So on either, on either test, we have a problem for the duty of loyalty. OK, but if I want to make this work, I, <laughs> I then need an argument to try to overcome. So, and, so I'm still playing with this. I'm still, this is where the most thinking, I think, still has to happen for me. I step back for a second, and I think, all right, look, but the duty of loyalty is primarily, first and foremost, it's formulated in terms of client-client conflicts. Right? In, in other words, duties to one client versus duty to another client. It's not formulated. It doesn't speak in terms of conflict in loyalty terms, client on the one hand versus firm on the other hand. And so maybe a conception of the duty of loyalty that would treat the relationship between the client and the firm somewhat differently than the relationship between two competing clients might help us. And, I, and so I, I get interested in that. And then I draw a bit of inspiration from some other contexts that seem to me to be somewhat similar. So if I'm the client and my firm presents me with a bill and I think it's $10,000 too large, but I carry on. I don't, I don't fire them or anything. They're still my lawyers and they're still acting for me, but I challenge their bill. We wouldn't think that the law firm now was in an irreconcilable duty of loyalty. Somehow because of their loyalty to me as client, they can't maintain no, our bill is right, and we'll fight you on that if we need to. I mean, we're, that bill is correct, and we're, 
the, nobody would say the law firm has to somehow prefer the client's interest by slashing its bill because the client says it should. The firm is clearly entitled to prefer its financial interest in getting paid that $10,000 over the position that's being taken by the client. If we take another context, if the client, uh, let's say, takes the, the you know, really further step and actually sues the firm for malpractice, we know that the firm is able to rely on confidential information obtained from the client to defend itself against the malpractice allegation. And again, we wouldn't expect the firm to have to just roll over and, and throw up its hands if the firm alleges any impropriety on the grounds that that's otherwise, to do otherwise would be disloyal, right? You have to prefer the client's interest above the firm's interest. Right? It seems to me a very strange conception of the duty of loyalty that you would have to always put the law firm's interest second to the client's interest. Well, if that's right, maybe that's the out, right? That may, maybe the argument here is it, would, it should not strike us. And again, the duty of loyalty is evolving. We, we, we don't necessarily know all of its parameters yet. It still has to be fleshed out. Maybe it should not strike us as a violation of a duty of loyalty that if a problem arose, the lawyer and the firm would go to an internal in-house ethics council and receive advice for the firm as firm, and that doing so is not violative of the duty of loyalty that that firm owes to its current client. And I, 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 have, to, I have to continue to think about this, and I, certainly, I really welcome thoughts on that, but I, I have a sense that I think that I could live with that, that I, I think I could support that being the, the conclusion. Um, and that's, that's kind of really where it is. Yeah? Um, I, I did come in late, so forgive me. That's if okay. I approached this already before, uh, before I came in, but in, in the examples that you laterally gave, I mean, isn't it a fundamental principle of, uh, of fiduciary law that it can be waived? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's always at the yep. discretion of the, that's right. of the agreement. Of, it's always subject that's to right. the agreement of the parties. No, that's so, right. So if a client continues in the relationship with the lawyer, mm -hmm. uh, either explicitly or implicitly in the understanding that the lawyer now has a conflict or the firm now has mm -hmm. a conflict, hasn't that client, in fact, yep. waived? Their right to, uh, or or uh, uh, or I should say, amended the, the 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 duty of loyalty that the firm owes to them to create that exception. That that might be right. Um, I, I guess one of my concerns I have there is that the time the, the timing is the problem, right? So in other words, the firm will go to its in-house ethics counsel to get this information before it raises. Even before, out of any sense of candor at all, it likely says anything to its client. So, so it isn't, a, it, I, I agree, it, it, it might be possible to say, the partner, let's say, says to the client, I'm worried about X, I'm going to go, I, I now propose to go down the hall and talk to my in-house ethics counsel, is that okay with you, client? And certainly if the client says that's okay, you're, you're fine. I suppose another way you could do it is you could put it in the retainer. Most firms don't at the moment, but you could. You could you could have language in the retainer that says, I explicitly agree that if an issue arises, you will be allowed to go to your in-house ethics counsel, and I won't seek to you know, claim that somehow that's a, a communication I can, I can get access to. But if you, if you haven't... Maybe Christian can just pick up on yeah, that one. It seems to me that's the most sensible mm -hmm. and cleanest way to mm -hmm. do this. And mm -hmm. So the clients know up front what the relationship is, and yep. it goes to, I guess... Um, Dissent by McLaughlin in Strother, yep. who says that the fiduciary, the nature of the fiduciary relationship is dependent upon the definitions in the retainer, yep. essentially. And that's a way out of the, the difficult Neil conundrum, other, right? Like, so she's using it for the same sort of reason I would be using it, right? Which is read too literally, Neil is too big a problem. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like that. So oh. why, why not just sort of make that the position instead yep. of having to go the more indirect routes or sort of imputing stuff or implicitly or potentially waiving it? No, but I, th I think you'd, you'd need both, right? Because I, I don't think it would be right to say if it's not in the retainer, it can't be done. I, I, that, that's what I, because Wallace raises some of those issues too, right? I mean, it's always easy after the fact to say, why didn't you guys put this in the, why didn't you address this in the retainer? But we know it's not always going to be addressed in the retainer. And I, and I don't know that that should by definition mean this will fail. Well, so I guess I see the obligation on law firms is none of these issues have been raised, mm -hmm. right? And the, 
the antenna should be up and they want to have in-house counsel mm -hmm. if they want to do this then they should make sure they've set up an infrastructure mm -hmm. to deal with this particular issue so i don't i think maybe <coughs> by making it purely contractual mm -hmm. right, then you you don't have real problems around right but uh, because but if I didn't, but if I didn't, let, let's just go back to first principles. So if I didn't make it purely contractual, why does the argument otherwise fall down? Like, have I not found a way around the loyalty problem even in the absence of the contract? I, I don't, if I, I haven't, then I, I haven't. I, then I, yeah. if I haven't, I still have a problem. But but you if haven't I haven't persuaded me that you have. Okay. It's not that you haven't persuaded. No, no fair, fair enough. <laughs> Diane, I need to sort of unpack a few things before I get to my real question. Okay. <laughs> Is the assumption, kind of on whatever side of anything we're on, that you identify a problem and at some point you've got to tell the client that you've identified the problem? You can't just say, yeah. I identified this problem, I worked itself through and I think we're okay and therefore I'm never going to tell the client anything. That's not on, is that? That, that actually, there are circumstances where that maybe could be on, that that could have, like, I mean, you owe a duty of candor to your client as well, right? So when, right. A, when, it, when an issue arises that would get over whatever that threshold would be, you would have to notify your client at least that there was this issue and that you've satisfied yourself on it. Okay. But, but, but it, I don't mean to be difficult, but no. even the duty of candor would have a threshold somewhere, right? You don't have okay. to tell your client everything you think of, and, and, but figure out you're okay on it. Okay, but we've gone over that initial threshold. Yep, yep. So, and you... You go down the hall to your ethics counselor, and your ethics counselor says, "We screwed up, or you screwed up really badly." Right. And you know, you got to tell your client, and it's going to all hell's going to break loose. Right. You, the, the principal is supposed to follow through on that yep. and let the chips fall where they may. Yeah, it seems to me in a case that's that bad, the lawyer would have to go back down the hall to their client, to the firm's client, yes. and say, and and as a result of the duty of candor say we, we now you I don't think you have to give the game away I think your insurer would be pretty unhappy if you said we screwed up and you guys better go out and sue us yeah. you, you you'd say we are concerned that there may be a problem here and we can as a result no longer continue to act for you you will have to get new counsel and new counsel will have to figure out that you have a right. potential claim against us and we're gonna which we're gonna defend vigorously even if the ethics council thinks, boy, did you screw this okay. up really and badly. And this is the context where you don't want the ethics counselor's opinion, opinion yeah. saying you screwed right. up. Exactly, exactly right. Yeah. exactly right. Exactly right. I mean, and, and, that's, and that's the position, and it's true in the American law as well. I mean, that, the firms are saying every other internal entity gets to go to its in-house counsel, and its in-house counsel writes this up, and that's, it's privileged, right? That doesn't see the light of day. Why, if we do that in a law firm context, should the client get, in a sense, this evidentiary windfall of getting to see ethics counsel saying, boy, did we screw this up? And if, the, and if we spin it forward the other way, I mean, if the ethics counsel thought that this wasn't privileged and could go out to the client, why would they write it down? Yeah. Right? I mean, I, would, I mean, in the wake of some of the early American cases, some academics tongue-in-cheekedly said that's what firms, firms would stop writing it down. They'd start just having telephone conversations about this stuff instead because they, could, they, they were worried that they just couldn't rely on the privilege. And if the ethics counselor says, uh, ultimately, looks fine, yep. explains why, yep. it seems to me you'd probably want to give that to the client. You, you, well, if, it, if it's your privilege, you could choose to, yeah. Yeah. right? But you might not want to. Like, the, the, so the, in other words, ethics counsel say, I'm worried about this, this, and this. But on a judgment call, I think we're okay. Yeah, so away we. Still discloses too much of Correct. vulnerability. That would be yeah. the fear. That would be a fear, anyway. It seems to me that the insurer has to jump in faster than that. The ethics counselor would have to call the insurer as soon as you have uh, you're on notice that there may mm -hmm. be a problem. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to call them, or you're going to put your insurance in jeopardy, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then when you make that call, they're going to give their advice to you, probably put you in somebody else's hands or tell you what to do or what not to do. So like yeah, that's I think the insurance piece is a really big part of this. Yeah, that's when, when the ethics counselor makes a determination that we've done something wrong or there's a good probability that we've done something wrong. Right? Mm -hmm. But I, that, that may well be right. Um, I don't know that that stops the generation of the communication. In other words, the, the, papers, the paper trail is still there. Right, but 
for the client to try to access as. Excuse me, then the fee return will go to the insurer. You're reporting to them, right? Uh, so not in, not initial. Then I don't not, not, again, it's a timing question. Like, I'm, not, I'm just not sure what happened in, in practice. It would happen faster. And the other problem, of course, would be if, if the firm wants to try, I mean, firms do try to sort of save these situations rather than have them immediately go off to the worst case scenario. And arguably, we, we should be wanting firms to try. That's why they have an ethics. I mean, the ethics council isn't just there to be the person who pulls the plug all the time. Yeah. That to some degree, they have a role in trying to find the way through that manages this for both the client and the firm. Um, can I ask a, a question, Stephen, that yeah. really uh, loops, I think it loops back ultimately to some of your points about the American experience at both ends. I don't, um, I don't fully understand the reason why uh, the existence of a conflict dissolves the privilege. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm with Stephen in that being an outstanding question. Yeah. But setting that, assuming that that's the case for the moment, then we're in the in the midst of exploring what would or would not constitute a conflict, and that's the dilemma that you're identifying with respect to Canadian law. Right. And uh, I think in Sarah's and Richard's interventions, they were suggesting about the way in which client consent mm -hmm. can waive the conflict. Yep. But I'm not entirely convinced of that for this reason, which is that if you look at Neil, mm -hmm. and if you look at the model code or what the CBA has proposed, uh, consent can dissolve a conflict unless the lawyer's view is that his or her ability to uh, 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 fully represent the client is not itself uh, compromised by uh, the interests of another client or the lawyer's own interest. Right. And it seems to me that that piece, the lawyer's own interest, is still on the table even though the client may have consented. Right. And if the lawyer in this context is honest about it, they might say, we got the client's consent, but geez, we, we're not going to be able to champion the client's interest here because it's just like sticking a knife in our own backs. And so it seems to me we're still left with that lawyer-client conflict dilemma if that's so, the judgment you reached, and can I just add one other feature yeah. to it? That formulation also exists, I think, in the American restatement and in the ABA rules, and so I'm curious to know whether that makes its appearance in the U.S. cases, that the lawyer-client conflict, because of the nature of the, of the law firm's interest here, seems to be on the table consistently as well. Yeah, I do, I, it, it, it doesn't in the earlier sort of run of U.S. cases because of the they get they don't get to that. Okay. They, they, the easy imputation just means they they, they find just, the okay. they just find the yeah. conflict right out of the out of the gate, okay. and so they don't get to that more I think subtle question. Um, I, I think you raise a good question, which would be, let's say the more some of these more recent cases like this one under Georgia start becoming the way forward, then maybe that question. Reappears. Does come onto the table now. I, you, you two would know this better. Than, I mean, is this is this in part played out by the the tension in Struther about sort of what you can, how far you can go with consenting to things in the retainer? Because I, I agree yeah. with you. There would be some things you couldn't waive, right? There, 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 there got to be some category of conflicts you, you can't right. waive. Or even if you waived, the the structure is that the, the lawyer makes an honest judgment that he or she still has right. too much at stake mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. to be able to really champion the client's. Cause, right, right. Which starts to feel like what's going on here. Right. Uh, there's still a conflict. Right. I think Neil would say that. I'm not sure if McLaughlin would. Maybe not, but uh, yeah, I she's think so contractual in her view yeah. of things. Right. Um, so I think that that's where they may actually might disagree in that. I mean, for 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 Vinny, there's still be the overarching mm -hmm. point. And, and there's for McLaughlin be. But even the, in the but even in the hard rule written by the Federation and the proposals by the CBA, they're still prepared to talk about substantial risk. That the lawyer identifies yep. base uh, of conflict based on obligations to another client, uh, substantial risk to quality representation, mm -hmm. based on the representation of another client, or the lawyer's own interest, right. and it's it's hard to walk away from that even if you're Chief Justice McLaughlin because that's that might not put loyalty at the highest level, but you don't want to dissolve it altogether. Two two issues though, right? I, I, I could see how even with the consent, even with the retainer, the firm might think we've clearly got to send this client away, and this client is going to be represented now by somebody else, and we're now in an adversarial position. We can't continue to act. But that might not necessarily mean they also lose the privilege right. with, about the communication that they had with in-house yeah. counsel. But, the, but that point might then depend on 
does the privilege go away because of a conflict, which is right. the reason you sent the client away. So right. it returns to that early, yep. somewhat confusing conclusion that these American courts seem to yep. have started with. And they get that they, they seem to pull that from the nature of the fiduciary relationship. That, that because it's a fiduciary relationship um, and you're attempting to, to set up a privilege vis-a-vis -vis your beneficiary, you can't do that if you're in a conflicted position. And I have some, I mean, I, 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 can't, I can't say to myself outright that that's got to be wrong, even though I agree that there seems to be a bit of a conceptual mismatch between saying, I mean, you, you clearly can't say what difference does it make as yeah. to whether you're in a conflict of interest as to why you wouldn't have the privilege. And I, I, I understand that as a good conceptual question, um, but I, I also can see where the courts are coming from in, in saying that, because I mean, otherwise, in a sense, there's no, nothing is flowing from the from the breach, right? Not, nothing's flowing from you having not lived up to your fiduciary obligations. You're, you're, you're in breach of these fiduciary obligations vis-a-vis -vis your client, and yet you get to claim privilege over the communications. So uh, I think they're worried about that. These have been very helpful questions. So that's really, really wonderful. It's so remarkable. They're, they're, they're still, they're, I'm trying to take it. I mean, when you go back and you read sort of Benny's decision and you read um, the Eddie Greenspan case, the CBC and Stewart, they put an awful lot of emphasis on the, the justification for the initial fiduciary obligation is to maintain public confidence in the legal profession. Mm -hmm. And I think you need, we, we need to push out a bit harder mm -hmm. as the, it's, it's not just it's a fiduciary relationship, mm -hmm. it's about how will people, clients see law firms if law firms seem as if they're betraying right. their own clients, right. it's that betrayal yep. moment. So there's that grounding principle that they've articulated as well. And so maybe the issue is then, can we but I, separate the roles of what in-house counsel can do, or sorry, in-house ethics counsel can do. Right. They can do this, this, and this, mm -hmm. but they can't do this, and you have to go to the outside counsel for that. Mm -hmm. um, that might be right, although, I suppose the question I'm looking at is a much more limited one, which is just whether privilege would attach to the communications mm -hmm. as opposed to what their role could be, right? And, and the communications are usually going to precede what they then might end up doing yeah. in yeah. further working on the matter. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's fair. There, there, there would be, I'm sure there would be situations, even with a firm that sets up proper screening and everything for its ethics counsel, where the firm will choose to use outside counsel because the optics of doing that are better. Mm -hmm. But we still have to figure out what happens to the communications that were generated before that happened, but before that, that, that stage. So, I mean, what, we didn't talk about it in the, in the presentation, but so one of the concerns that I, th I think is more prevalent in the U.S., although I, I suppose I could see it arising here, is cases where something comes up that actually is quite fundamental. You are now, you know you are at odds with your client and you know your client is very likely to sue you, and yet you can't dump your client because you are in the middle of something where you need court consent to get off the record, or, or you have a transaction that your corporate department is about to close or there will be very serious financial repercussions. And so you, you, you get to a situation where, on the one hand, you have a set of ethical rules requiring you to continue to act, and on another hand, you have a set of ethical rules that require you to yeah. get off. And it's that interim period where you, you bite the bullet and you say, we are continuing to act because we have an obligation to do that. But at the same time, our in-house counsel is generating documents that, that we're going to use because we know this malpractice claim is coming. And it, it just seems... The argument the firm would make is we, we can't lose privilege over that because we were in good faith continue carrying. We didn't, you're, you're in a sense punishing us for not pulling the plug more vigorously on the client in these cases. And not screwing them worse. Right, yeah. right, right. But it's ironic in the sense that um, if you were to disclose it to the client, they might fire you right. on the spot. Right. If you don't disclose it, they're stuck because they don't know that you carry on and do the rest of the work competently. But if they only knew, which by the privilege arrangement they can't, they'd uh, but fire in a minute. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm saying, so, so how does the clock tick in all this? I'm having the exact same problem, right? At what point in this process do you realize that your interests have, have diverged? And what part of the advice is and isn't covered as a consequence? Like, presumably you have to have a conversation that predates that realization before you get there. I guess what I'm saying. No, I don't know, I don't know that. I, I, it is quite possible, I think, that... You would know the minute you walk in. No, 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 I, I think it's... Po to the ethics council's office. 
Yeah, well, you, you have a you have an inkling, and you know, I'm, I'm, I have trouble with the idea of saying you'd always have to take that inkling first and foremost to the client somehow. I mean, you you might take that inkling first to your in-house ethics counsel, because your in-house ethics counsel might say, no, 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 it's fine. Just, just, in fact, you would think in a lot of situations, you, you'd hope one of the reasons for having an ethics counsel is you'd go down the hall and your ethics counsel would say, no, nope, you're good, mm -hmm. you're fine, we're mm -hmm. we're okay, um, and then the issue probably never even comes up with the client, right? It, it's, an alarm, it's a little alarm that went off for you, and you checked, and you're fine. Mm -hmm. But if the little alarm goes off, and you check, and your in-house ethics counsel says, we, got a, we have a big problem here. That's right. the most interesting scenario, and yes. Diane puts her finger on the tension between, on the one hand, the duty of candor, right. yeah. uh, and the fact that you're genuinely in a meaningful conflict of interest between your firm and the client, yeah. and you're continuing to act. And the client's sitting in the office down the hall. That's what Without knowing. Right. Yeah, that's what no, 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 so but with. So, so the duty of candor is clearly going to require you to advise the client that something has happened that has created this conflict. Of, but by that point, the communication has happened, right? You've you've, you've gotten the you've obtained yeah. the advice yeah. from your ethics counsel. Yeah. But isn't it seems to me that maybe just an irony that if they seem to be thinking in the situation where there's no problem, there's a big problem, right? Right. But you should really start doing these this things. This. That's right. I think the irony in the position that kind of gets developed, if I'm understanding correctly, is that you would have a duty of candor to share with your client. Like, if the advice is now start doing, if it if it if it relates to mm -hmm. the strategy or approach you take to the case, or the way in which you communicate with the client, or what you that that in those in between kind of spaces, you might have to tell them more under the duty of candor than you would. Big problem. Like, so then you're like, well, we think there well, might be a problem. You might have to tell them, we think we now need to start doing the following thing. <laughs> right. I'm not sure you'd have to tell them, or you'll have a claim again. You know, if we don't do these things, yeah. it will be negligent for us, and you will have a claim against us. Right, but you might have to tell them, for example, that we have these, that there would be a conflict if we didn't do X, Y, and Z, like to reveal yeah. Yeah. the relationship that you stand in relation to others, because otherwise the client could be instructing you. What that actually does do is limit the capacity of the client to instruct you in certain ways around the, so it could limit the ways in which the lawyer can give counsel or can pursue the matter if they suddenly are arrived at a situation where they're not, they don't have a big problem and they don't have no problem, but actually they, they have to navigate the mm -hmm. terrain. Mm -hmm. And the navigating of that current terrain will affect, limit, right. restrict, or but, shape right. the particular strategy you take. It seems to me that you'd be under more of an ethics, like more of right. an obligation in terms of candor to say, actually you can't instruct me this way and here's why, or, or we could do it this way. But now as a counsel, I'm limited in what I could do that another counsel might be able to do for you. Whereas it'd be a big problem to sort of, sort of say, we don't know, we might have a problem. Right. Like you may have more of a duty to reveal. But I. I think that that could be right. I don't. I don't. The duty. It, it, it seems to me the duty of candor is never going to require you just to, in a sense, turn over the opinion, right? You're. They're going to tell you various things, and based on the duty of candor, you're going to have to have a sit down with your client and and say certain things, uh, and you're, I think, going to be inclined to try to put a positive spin on it and say, okay, we have these issues, but don't don't panic or jump out the window or something. We we have a we have a potential solution here, and here's what we're going to attempt. And do you think? Mm -hmm. like, sort of the yeah, opinion of the ethics counselor. Okay. Yeah, that then you that then you may have a as you to the extent that that opinion mm -hmm. is shaping how you represent the client, what you're able to do or mm -hmm. willing to do on their behalf to keep your butt out of yep. trouble. Yep. Is suddenly where you now have more of an obligation to reveal that there is this opinion from your in house counsel that is shaping the the, the choices that mm -hmm. you're making on your client's behalf. Yep. And that seems almost more problematic. Than where we really want to dwell, which is a wow, and that seems to me to get close to branch yeah, point about you start hitting a point where you just decide you can't do this. You can't you, do it. You, you're gonna have to stop. Well, no, but even when you think you can't, like no, 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 but I, I do the positive spin thing. Yeah, no, no, I can. I just can only do it these ways. Well, you're not right. transparent with the client. Client, right? That you're doing it these ways because, because of what you're being you told. Keep your butt out of the sling, right. not because this yep. is the best way to represent you. Yeah. 
do you get to bill for that too? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's I'm thinking says, about my problem. No, 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 but this, this is clear. The, the American cases say yeah. you've got to you got to be kidding if you docketed the hours that in-house counsel spent to the client's file <laughs> and bill them problems. for it. Yeah. There's there's no way you're going to claim per you know. You, so one of the indicia on a case by case test is yeah, yeah, yeah. there's if no way you that. could build there's no way you could have billed the client for the but, advice. But imagine then the conversation where the client sees all these hours of work that aren't billed for because the firm does that and asks, and the answer is that's all the work we did to get our asses out of a sling. Right, right. right. Although they argue they shouldn't see those hours at all. Yeah. Right? They wouldn't they wouldn't ever <laughs> they wouldn't see a bill that says here's all these hours we're not billing you yeah. for. They you just wouldn't disclose them. In the same way that it, again. Part of the project is to try to see to what extent under, I guess, American law first and then under Canadian law second, we could mirror this like outside counsel. Because mm -hmm. we know this all, this is garden variety stuff for outside counsel, for, for uh, McInnes Cooper to pick up the phone and call Stuart McKelvey and say, you know, we have a problem, we need to retain you. It's, we, all of that's going to work, right? There isn't going to be a conflict and the, it, the, the communications will be privileged. So if we want ethics counsel in-house to be a meaningful way for firms to move forward, I think there is an agenda to actually try to find a conceptual way that it would work. So why is it so important to salvage that? So when you start, you mean to make it work, like what, to make the in-house in ethics counsel work? Like the question I'm asking right. next is, why is it so important to salvage that? Well, on uh, the facts of right. these situations, yeah. it plainly does not work. So well, where does it work to justify? Well, so, trying to make it work here. So the paper talks about, in some ways, the, the benefits of, it's, it's a bit uh, it's of an extrapolation from the general benefits of having in-house counsel, gen, right? Yeah. Why would Bell have in-house counsel? Well, because they're more available and they know the business well and they know the people and they know the structure. So there's all kinds of synergies you get from being able to use your own people rather than always having to go outside. Mm -hmm. well, and, Yep, that's, that's another. That's 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 the ABA ta the ABA talks about that at length, right? They say having the person actually there on the floor because we'll, we'll seek them we're, out. we're only talking about part of this, right? I mean, most firms that have an ethics council, there's a, both a proactive and a reactive yeah. role, right? And we, we we obviously want the proactive role, and that has all kinds of positive benefits. Um, it just so my con I, I think the case to be made for why having big firms have in-house ethics councils is not a hard case to make. Um, but then the question is, do you diminish in many ways the utility of that if you rob them yeah. of this privilege? That, that's the worry. For, for that, that's in the literature, that's the concern. And the case in which you're going to rob them of that privilege, you can't tell in advance, right. in a sense, because you can't tell right. what the opinion is. Right. That's, that's, that's the problem. pitch. That, that's so you want to you, you, you right. want to be able to go to them, no right. matter what. Right. And like, it, like, like normal solicitor client yeah. privilege, it's really important to know the lay of the land yeah, before yeah. the communication well, yeah, happens, right? Yes, I mean, you, yes. you, you need to have some degree of confidence that, that this is going to work, right? Yeah. Or you will be gun shy in some yeah. way, right? That's, Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's the argument. Yeah. Well, I think if you find, Stephen, that it is robbed of its utility in its entirety, you'll have opened up a wonderful career, a post academic career for outhouse ethics council. <laughs> <laughs> Devlin et al. <laughs> <laughs> ethics council. For hire. I like the outhouse idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, I actually think a lot of retired judges do this. Right. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. And not get paid for it. Right. That oh. would be better yeah. ideas. Yeah, that would be something. That would be something. <laughs> Maybe on that thought, we should draw to a close and thank Stephen yes. for uh, a great seminar and thank yeah. everyone for participating. It was there were great questions and comments. Yeah. Very helpful for me. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot, Stephen. Yeah. Good job. Good job. That was Thank you.